Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, my name is Derek Mosley. I'm the director of uh, the Lubar Center, where you are right now. And I am thrilled to be here, thrilled to have my, one of my really good friends and former boss uh, here today to get to uh, interview. Um, this is part of a new series that we started here at the Lubar Center called The Get to Knows. The purpose of this was to bring people from the community that have an effect on our lives every single day, but we really don't know who they are personally. And so this is a little bit different from the on the issues uh, type programming where we're talking about hard hitting issues and things of that nature. This is more of a conversation to get to know um, certain individuals in the community. Uh, before I get started, it's important that I um, acknowledge our uh, benefactor here in the room today. And I wanted to everybody give a round of applause for Sheldon Lubar. Thank you, sir, for being here. And I am going to get right into it, and I want to introduce to you the new director of the Andrews Center for Restorative Justice, Mary Trigiano. So, Mary, you grew up in southeastern Wisconsin. Did. Uh, where exactly did you grow up? Racine. All right, you went to Racine, and where did you go to high school? I went to Racine St. Catharines. Okay, and the reason why I say that is, Mary will not say this, but I was doing some research, and... On October 28th, Mary will be inducted into the Racine St. Catharines Hall of Fame. So I wanted to make Thank sure, you. I knew you wouldn't say it, so I had to say it. Not for sports, <laughs> <laughs> although I could have been. So what do, you, what do you remember about growing up in Racine? Uh, I remember a lot. I grew up with uh, four siblings. Um, Where do you fall in there? I'm the second oldest. Okay. Um, my father was a carpenter. Um, built our house uh, that we lived in. Uh, also built my garage for me in, uh, in Milwaukee, but he was a wonderful carpenter. Um, very, you know, detail-oriented um, and just a wonderful man with a great sense of humor. Um, uh, my mom, who's here today. Yay, mom. Hey, mom. Um, <laughs> if you really want to know about me later, you can talk to her. Um, <laughs> She was an optician, um, but first and foremost, she raised the five of us, um, all very close in age. And we grew up uh, just carefree, and uh, we had wonderful parents and just a wonderful upbringing, uh, terrific schooling at the Catholic high school, actually Catholic grade school and Catholic high school. Um, and then we all went off and did what we did. And you went off and went to Oshkosh, University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. You studied there. And I want to know, while you were at Oshkosh, what made you decide to go to law school? Um, that's a great question. I think a couple things. Um, when I was going to St. Catharines, two things were on my mind. One, my grandmother, who has my namesake, Mary Elizabeth, worked at a law firm. And so I always would kind of watch and listen to her and what she would tell me about the lawyers at the law firm. Um, and then the second thing was um, we had a principal at St. Catharines who was a nun, um, but she also was a lawyer. And I thought, wow, you know, that's pretty cool. Principal, lawyer, nun. Um, if she can do it, I can do it, right? <laughs> and so I did a criminal justice major, and actually double major, criminal justice poli sci, and I'm like, what can I do with that? You know, two-thirds of the class was going to be law enforcement, and I really didn't want to do that kind of work. Um, and then there was a handful of us that said, you know what, we're going to take this, uh, uh, our bachelor's degree and go into law, uh, go into law. And then you went to University of Wisconsin Law School. I did. And while you were there, what were the types of courses that you gravitated towards? Yeah, so that was, that was a long time ago. Not that long ago. Yeah, it was. Not that long. A lot longer than you. <laughs> um, so I, one of my a couple of my favorite courses, but one of my most favorite was Alternative Dispute Resolution. And it was the first that was offered at the law school, and we had well-known teachers, um, Brian, um, Howard Bellman and Brian Yaffe, who had been practicing alternative dispute resolution and <coughs> mediation, negotiation, uh, and, and other conflict resolution. And I really felt like that resonated with me and what I wanted to do. The other thing uh, that I really found enjoyable was the uh, clinical programs offered there. One was uh, LEIP, and that's short for Legal Assistance to Institutionalized Persons. Um, and what we would do would be we would work with uh, staff attorneys, um, and we would go into the prisons, and we would represent uh, individuals who are incarcerated in their legal matters. And so 
I did a lot of work uh, at Techita back then. Um, and it just, it really, you know, gave me a different viewpoint on people who commit crimes and are incarcerated. Um, you know, I learned about their families. I learned about their wants and their needs and their, their past trauma. Um, and so I really enjoyed that work. And upon graduation, what was your first job out, outside of UW? Yeah, so my first job was at uh, one of the larger law firms here in Milwaukee called Reinhardt Berner, Van Duren, Norris, and Rieselbach. They, <laughs> all the law firms have since shaved their name down to one or two. So now it's, I, I think it's just Reinhardt or Reinhardt Berner. But um, I joined their litigation uh, department, and it wasn't necessarily my first choice, but I really enjoyed uh, the individual lawyers who worked there, especially in the litigation department. What I really was focused on when I graduated, I wanted to do legal services um, and do civil legal services for those who could not afford um, uh, representation. So you joined Reinhardt. So I joined Reinhardt. <laughs> Here's why, because there were no openings anywhere in the legal services field. Um, places like Legal Aid Society, Legal Action, Center for Public Representation, um, LAIP uh, through the law school were not hiring um, at the time. And so Reinhardt was the last to interview on campus and I was like, uh-oh, I better do something. <laughs> um, and, and it was a great experience. Um, I really enjoyed uh, doing litigation there meeting all the lawyers I did in the community. I also kept, where's the law students here? Raise your hands. Yeah, there's a good group of law students. When you graduate, and I think I've told some of you this already, if you go into a firm, take one or two pro bono cases all the time. When you finish one, take another from legal action, legal aid, whoever, because it's really important to give back when you become a lawyer. Um, and for those who don't know, pro bono is free legal services uh, to people who can't afford uh, legal services. That's my pitch. But then while you were at Reinhardt, you got the itch again, and then you went to become the managing attorney at Legal Action in Wisconsin. I did. All right, and how long did you hold that position? 10 years. All right, and explain what the managing attorney does at Legal Action. Well, first when I left, um, I joined them to run the Volunteer Lawyers Project. Um, and the Volunteer Lawyers Project was what I was doing when I was up in, at Reinhardt, right? We would try to engage lawyers uh, in the community to do pro bono legal services. Um, and so I did that for a period of time. Our managing attorney then left, and so I not only did the Volunteer Lawyers Project, but I became the managing attorney and did that for another eight years, uh, 10 years total at Legal Action. Um, they didn't have a lot of funding, and so we all doubled up on all the jobs that we did um, to try to make ends meet and make sure we were providing access to justice. But while you were at Legal Action, you got the judicial itch. I did. And so what made you, because you got appointed, so what made you fill out that application to become a judge? Yeah, well, truth be told, I never ever thought that I would want to become a judge. Um, but when I was doing the legal services program, especially the Volunteer Lawyers Project, it bought, brought me into contact with a lot of judges. Um, judges who called me up and said, hey, we need pro bono work over here because there's a lot of uh, need. Um, and so I became one of the judge's court commissioners, which is, you know, it's, it's a sort of a, just a title that you carry. You can do weddings and um, other, a couple other things. Um, but I became her um, court commissioner, and then she and other female judges said, look, one of our judges, Judge Vic Mannion at the time, is going to retire a year before his term is up and the governor's gonna get an appointment. And we just know the governor, Governor Doyle at the time, was gonna appoint a female. Um, and I said, well, you know, I have a three-year-old and I really love my job and, you know, I'm doing a lot of good in the community, but oh, what the heck, I'll apply. And 26 people later and it was boiled down to three women, so they were right. Um, and I got the nod from Governor Doyle. It's funny you mentioned Vic Mannion. I clerked for Vic Mannion. I'm going to tell oh, you yeah. a story about him. I don't know if you know this. Do you know that he could rip a phone book in half with his bare hands? <laughs> I, it, it, it's a true story. I, I was clerking for him when I was at law school. Bill Ward. You, you, Bill Ward. You know that, right? That's absolutely true. I, um, I was clerking for him, 
And uh, I walked into the room and, the, and one of the, his clerks said, hey, you know, Judge Manny can rip a phone book in half. <laughs> and I was like, give me a break. And Did you actually see it? Yeah, he ripped it in half. How? With no. his bare hands, he was amazing. So, so talk um, there's a lot, we have a lot of stuff that intertwine now that I think about it. So, oh, did. so after, when you, so you applied, you got appointed by yes. Governor Doyle. What was your first assignment on the bench? Children's court. Okay. Uh, usually judges get placed in either children's court or the misdemeanor courts. For some reason, they think those are the easy courts, right? That you can cut your teeth on and uh, don't get me wrong. When I became chief, I had, I had to figure out where to place people um, as well, but um, I was happy. I, I had never really practiced criminal law. Um, not that I wouldn't ultimately have to do that kind of work, but I thought being at children's court was the best um, exercise of my talents and what I wanted to do in terms of helping families succeed. What kind of cases did you hear at children's court? Uh, so in the beginning, I heard uh, children, children in need of uh, protection or services. That's when a parent's uh, child is removed from their care because of a variety of issues. Could be abuse, could be neglect. Um, and also delinquency cases. So I did hear uh, cases where kids were committing uh, adult crimes. Um, we did guardianships a little bit in termination of parental rights matters, but by and large, the bulk of the work was child welfare cases, and delinquency. So you left Children's Court, despite the fact that you loved it. You came back downtown and did a stint in domestic violence court. Is I that did, correct? yeah. They kicked me out of Children's Court. <laughs> but you came back. I did. Yeah. So we have a rotation scheme where our judges have to rotate out of um, their current division every three to four years. I ended up five years at Children's Court, uh, then just uh, then Chief Judge Kitty Brennan um, had me working on a project that we called the Unified Children and Family Court Project, where we were trying to do family law, custody placement, visitation at Children's Court. And so we created that project. <coughs> and then uh, Chief, then Chief Judge Kremers um, had sent me to do training uh, at the national, one of the national organizations on domestic violence. And it was clear he wanted to put me in our, one of our three uh, domestic violence problem solving courts. And so I did a little over three years there. Um, a lot, a lot of trials, a lot of pain and grief and struggles and violence and um, but we managed to do what I think was the best we could do in those courts, trying to help families uh, figure out their situation. But you got your chance to go back to Children's Court. So what, what about Children's Court did you like so much that you wanted to go back? Yeah, great question, Derek. You know, I felt it was the place that we could do the most good, uh, the most prevention work, the most um, addressing the needs in a more humanistic way of individuals out there. We were also right on the cusp of creating our first uh, family drug treatment, treatment court, the first of the kind in the state of Wisconsin, not nationally, but first in Wisconsin. One of our judges there had started it and then I rotated into it and had to help build it and create the family drug treatment court. Um, and so that to me was uh, a way that we could reshape justice for families um, that would help them succeed rather than our traditional approach, which just felt like we kept seeing people over and over and over. And what treatment courts are, uh, if you will, is um, a way to look at a particular issue facing a family. In this case, if your child was removed mainly because you have a substance use disorder, right, a disease, um, where there was a ton of neglect or sometimes abuse, you could volunteer to apply to come into the family drug treatment court. Um, and it wasn't, as some people think, soft on crime, soft on what was going on. It was probably the hardest court that I presided over, and it was the hardest thing these families had to do because they actually had to get into recovery, get sober, work on their mental health issues, and tried to parent their children when they really didn't know how to. Um, and it brought us together as a team of individuals um, working with the, um, that back then St. A, Tim and Ann uh, Grove from St. A, 
um, as well as Children's Hospital ongoing case management team to help support these families, not just the women and the men, but their children as well, to get them back on track so that we could place those children back in their care safely. And we had a lot of really, really, and we still do good results from that. So you're there for a bit, you install the programming, but they pull you back again on another rotation. So you do a little stint as a civil, in the civil division. I did. And while you're in the civil division though, you also become the deputy chief judge, correct? I did, yes. And became, and then shortly after that. Became your boss. Became my boss, right, as the chief judge. Such a good guy. Oh, <laughs> putting up with me. So let me put that, let me rewind a little bit. So Maxine White was the chief judge. Yep. She left to go to the Court of Appeals. Correct. And then you took over as the chief judge. And you came uh, February of 2020 where like nothing was going on, right? It was, <laughs> things seemed to be going well. Um, but tell us what the chief judge does first. Okay. So you want me to tell you what I did first as chief judge? No, no, just in general, because we'll go into that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the chief judge of Milwaukee County uh, is the administrative head over all 46, 47, I'm the 47th judge, but uh, 46 branches, um, uh, which are the judges, uh, 20 some court commissioners. Um, we have authority over the municipal courts. 19 jurisdictions. 19 jurisdictions, um, as well as working with um, all the stakeholders um, that make up the justice system. So the clerk of court's office we work with, we work with court reporters, we work with um, you know, law enforcement, uh, the DA's office, prosecutors, you name it. It's sort of in the, what I call the ecosystem of the world of justice. And the chief uh, has um, statutory rules that I have to follow and authority as well as Supreme Court rules. Uh, in running the system. I don't have, I didn't have a calendar. No uh, chief judge in Milwaukee County hears cases anymore because of the volume of administrative work they have to do on a daily basis. Which brings us to February of 2020. So mm -hmm. February 2020, global pandemic. Um, the court system is, how many, do you know how many cases are processed through the uh, circuit court system on a daily basis? Uh, not, I don't know daily, but annually where, you know, if you look at small claims, the criminal division family at uh, children's court, thousands, 10, probably 10,000, 10,000 plus. And so you have these cases, a decision is made to close the courts. What's on your mind? What are you thinking about at that point? Help. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we, you know, interestingly enough, I think one of the powers of Milwaukee County uh, justice system is our relationships with each other um, from law enforcement to corrections, but mostly in between. We pulled together, um, well, we were supposed to pull together a tabletop discussion of the stakeholder leadership, which included me as chief judge, John Chisholm, Tom Reed, the sheriff, um, the chief. chief of police, yeah, the county exec, um, the clerk of courts, anybody who was anybody, because we saw this coming, um, where some jurisdictions across the country didn't or didn't believe it was coming. We were supposed to meet March 17th, St. Patty's Day. Um, we were not gonna serve green beer, because we had, we had a mission, right? We are like, what are we gonna do? The county exec provided us with um, a couple of um, really smart, smart public health officials that we got to consult with. Um, and we didn't meet on March 17th. We had to meet earlier because it was coming so fast because people were testing positive in Milwaukee County. Um, and we didn't know if it was gonna come, you know, like a, a storm and death and destruction because that's what was happening places or if it was gonna be something else. But we didn't wanna take a chance with people's lives. So, um, about 30 days into my chiefdom, um, I shut the courts down and sent everybody home, except a select group of people who had to keep processing some of the cases. We had people in custody, in jail, we had domestic violence cases, and so we selected some cases that we would keep hearing, 
and then we sent people home. The minute we sent people home, we started plotting about how to get back up because we know that those thousands of cases that we hear are gonna start backing up and creating a backlog. So we started planning with our stakeholder group, this really good bunch of people that really care deeply about access to justice and keeping people safe, how we were gonna do that. And that incorporates a lot, right? It's not just prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, it's also jurors. You had to stop jury trials. So people who are waiting for their jury trials didn't have an opportunity to do the jury trial. And I heard you say something, a statistic that said that once the courts were starting to roll back open, what, what, what got you to that point to make the decision that we had to start opening the courts back up? Because the cases started backing up. I mean, we had, we had people who were arrested and sitting in custody who wanted their day in court, they wanted trials, right? Not only did they want to have trials, but their victims, alleged victims of their crimes wanted to have their day in court as well. Um, and what we were trying to do was we were trying to keep uh, the jail single-celled, right, so that you wouldn't have a spread of the virus in the jail because if you had an outbreak in the jail, it could, be, it could mean death. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were shifting many people over to the House of Corrections, now the Community Resource Center out in Franklin. Um, and so we were constantly trying to balance, right, the need to come back up to process these cases, to give people their day in court, not just the criminal division, people who wanted divorces, people who were at children's court doing child welfare cases. And one of the biggest things that we needed to do is get trials back up and running because if you have a trial pending, you're more apt to either do the trial or plead, right? So we worked with the county. The county had some CARES dollars we outfitted our courtrooms with plexiglass and distanced people. We had face masks and hand sanitizer. Um, I remember one day Judge Ashley, who's now the chief judge, and I were walking down the hallways. We were the only ones there sometimes, and we were distributing hand sanitizer because we had no one else to do it. Um, we, at Children's Court, we didn't have enough space at the children's court facility in the courtroom to do trials because you'd be almost sitting on top of the other person. So we worked with the county and we modified Zufari Center to become <laughs> a courtroom for trials. Um, and that we did that for over a year and processed some of our trials there as well. Um, you know, thinking back on all this, I like I like want to talk about something else. But no, no, um, no. But it was it was this major feat, and everyone needed to work together, because if one system was impacted, public defenders, right? We would feel it in the entire system. If we didn't have enough clerks, if we didn't have enough jurors we would all feel the pain of that because we were so uniquely situated to be um, in need of each other being healthy in terms of numbers and ability to do cases. Um, I don't believe we ever lost anybody in the no. court system um, at all. So that was a good, very good thing. Well done, my friend. Thank you. So, um, but, and, go ahead. And I got all the 19 Municipalities to deal with, which, which I, I mean, as someone who was uh, part of those 19 municipalities, all those municipalities are very different, right? And so, and everybody had different <laughs> philosophies. Some people were no mass, some people were going in person, we're not changing anything. How you navigated that was pretty amazing. Well, we got on a Zoom call. All, nine, all, all 19. 19 of the leaders the presiding, you were presiding at that point in time, and we're like, what do we need to do, right? And we did what we needed to do. Um, Sometimes it wasn't pretty, um, but it was what we had in the moment and the information we had in the moment that was driving all of our decision making. And it was really good to have people like you, people like John Chisholm and Tom Reed and the sheriff and the clerk of courts, all of those people pitching in and figuring this out because it was new to all of us, right? We didn't know what necessarily we were facing. We were just trying to be guided by public health advice and common sense. So the court's back open. Um, you're trying to, you find out that you have this huge backlog 
and you receive some um, COVID relief money mm -hmm. to help take down that shortage. You know, I think it was about 1,600 felony cases. Is that correct? So, uh, something like that, backlog. Yeah, 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 backlog of cases that were backlogged. How did you attack that? Because not only were you dealing with the 1,600 backlog cases, uh, staff was retiring and leaving. Yeah. And it was hard to hire public defenders and DAs because they weren't making enough money. How, how did you all navigate that, um, get yeah. the courts back down from that 1,600 case backlog? Well, I, I, we still have a backlog, even after I left, but it's down to, I believe, a manageable level. Um, here, you're right, here's the issue, right? We, like COVID became last year's problem, right? We understood it, we could protect ourselves against it, we were smart about it, we protected people, but we couldn't figure out, and it was very hard to deal with the staffing crisis. And you see it everywhere, right? And probably most of your organizations, if you work in organizations, are struggling with staffing. And I kid you not, probably in every stakeholder group, they were down 30 to 40% in the number of people you needed to conduct business in a business as usual. And that again impacted what we could do to chip away at the backlog. If you have a backlog, you actually need more people, not less, to do what you needed to do to get trials running, to get people's cases processed, to work with individuals. Um, so we thought, okay, all we need is more money, right, to hire people. So we worked together in our community justice council um, and all those stakeholders I mentioned before. And we worked with the mayor and the county exec to make a plea to the governor because there was some ARPA dollars, American Relief Plan Act dollars available. Um, and the governor gave us a significant amount. Um, and so we you know, rolled up our sleeves and we're like, okay, we have this money, let's start doing more hiring. And we were able to get that back up a little bit, but still the capacity issue loomed. Um, and so it was really, it was a struggle and still is to this day to completely get rid of the backlog. But I do wanna say one thing about the backlog. As chief judge, I meet with all the chief judges across the state and we would get data on a regular basis about our backlog, because we're gonna look at data. We just don't wanna guess at what we're doing, right? Um, Milwaukee County, because we worked so hard in 2020, 2021, 22, to come back up, like it was a daily, weekly, nightly, weekend event to try to get this done, our backlog in Milwaukee County only represented 10, and this is the felony numbers, felony backlog cases, represented only 10% of the backlog statewide. Um, and that means other counties were struggling more than us um, in, an, in an added number sort of way. So we kept trying to get that down. And 10% and is still a lot for Milwaukee County, but it wasn't like other counties or other municipalities across the country who weren't even doing jury trials until just recently, right? We started in the summer of 2020, bringing our jury trials back up. Now I heard a stat, which is just astronomical to me. So I know the caseloads for judges, both municipal and circuit are ridiculous. But as a result of the backlog, the caseload increased 50%? That's, is that what you remember it being? I saw the statistic just that it was almost up to 50% for some, some of the courts in Milwaukee County Circuit Court. No, I think if you, if you take, let's just if you take the felony courts and the 1600, we have 14 felony judges. If you just divide that by, and this is just easy math, I mean, there's a lot more complexity to it, but if you divide the 1600 <coughs> by the number of judges we have to get the job done, it's about a third more on their caseload. Okay. So it's not quite a half. Um, and, and Significantly, children's court, family court, our civil division, except our small claims, but our civil division never had a backlog because we were able to use Zoom in a very creative way to get some of those cases done. Which brings me to my next question. What were the, some of the ways that you used to bring down the court, the, the caseload? Yeah, so um, we used uh, Zoom technology. Um, we used some earlier dollars from the county that 
it was CARES Act, um, and I can't remember quite what that stands for. But we use that to outfit our courtrooms with Zoom technology. Um, actually, I think it was something like $15,000 per courtroom with CARES Act dollars to get it up so it could function with, with Zoom technology, which really, really significantly helped, but it didn't help our criminal division. That really needed to be in person. You can't do jury trials over Zoom, although everyone's tried to do that across the country. It's really difficult to do that uh, for a variety of reasons. So Zoom was one way we kept the numbers down. Um, I also um, connected with one of our retired judges, Judge uh, John Frankie, who decided to come out of retirement and work full time as another court uh, to do criminal cases. And so he was doing a lot of jury trials, um, contested cases. And so, but it was hard to support him in that role because we needed court reporter for him, we needed a clerk, we needed sheriff's deputies, and again, they're all down by 30 to 40 percent in their numbers. So um, we patched together different ways of doing things and we used him as one of our help. Also, my other colleagues um, really pitched in to take spin jury trials when they could. Um, and if you take a jury trial, it's likely that case is going to either resolve or go to either a, a, a guilty verdict or a, an acquittal. But you're at least getting that case done and not bumping it down to another date. And so they all pitched in. We opened, for misdemeanors, uh, we opened night court to test the waters on night court. Um, but I gotta tell you, everyone who was working in the system was so exhausted, it was hard to get people to go do those cases in the evening, although we had some, we had some volunteers. Um, and a couple of the judges volunteered, and we did some of those cases to alleviate the daily stuff. Um, there was also less filings going on, so our misdemeanor numbers, we resolved our backlog in there pretty early on. It was the felony numbers that we were struggling with. So how did you deal with the burnout from the judges and the court reporters and everyone that's working in the system? Uh, it was hard because on the one hand, you want to give people a break or take your vacations, but you also wanted to do the work of the courts because if you weren't doing a case in your court, you couldn't schedule anything in your court, you had people sitting in jail. You had people, you had victims who were prepared to testify and they couldn't. So we started losing some of those individuals um, who just were like, well, it's a year or two years now. I don't even, I don't even want to be involved in this case anymore. But, um, you know, the other thing that we could see happening was that when you give individuals who are working twice as hard because of backlogs more cases, they tend to want to leave. And so we lost people that way as well. So it was this constant balancing act of trying to support the people who worked in the courts, um, but also get the cases done because we needed to mete out justice. Now, has the courts kept some of those things? Are you doing night court? Are you doing Zoom still? Are you doing? Yeah. Um, not, we're not doing night court, um, but Zoom is still a tool that um, many of the divisions that we have use to, to do their cases. Um, John Frankie is doing some cases. I don't think he's doing full time anymore. We still have judges who are helping each other out and trying to figure out how best to work uh, in the system. And so the numbers aren't going up, but they're not going down as fast as we would like them to. And I know Judge Ashley is tackling that with his leadership team as well. Um, you just do your best with the resources that you have. So you navigate through the COVID pandemic in early 2020, and at some point you decide, yeah, I think I'm gonna go to Marquette. <laughs> what, because uh, I know how much you love being on the bench, so okay. what exactly was it that enticed you to come? I heard you were coming. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, if he's coming, it can't be that bad, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I loved being chief judge. I loved being a judge. Um, but, you know, there was this opportunity, um, right? And I thought, you know, my, my work in the courts, I've done as much as I can, as well as I can. And 
Janine was leaving, right? She was going to retire, and so, and then we had this wonderful, wonderful gift from Sue and Louis Andrew to endow the work Janine was doing here, um, as well as others, um, in the law school with restorative justice practices. And so I had a conversation with her. I applied, um, and I was like, you know what? The other thing is, I love, I found that I love teaching. <laughs> And I've taught judges like you and, and lawyers and people in the justice system for 20 plus years on a variety of things, problem solving courts, trauma and trauma informed care, um, sometimes restorative justice. And I was teaching just before the pandemic hit. And I was uh, co-teaching with Tim Grove, the trauma guy out there. We were teaching uh, problem solving courts and the neuroscience of trauma because we thought law students needed to know about that. And Dean Kearney was gracious enough to give us our opportunity to try that out. Um, and Tim and I taught together for a while, and then Tim couldn't do it anymore, so I enlisted the help of another person who's really gifted around trauma and trauma-informed care, and that was Terry Darun Cassini from the Medical College. So we were teaching, and I became chief. The pandemic hit, and I had to lay that down. I couldn't keep up with everything else and teach. And I was really sad about that, actually. And so part of what the Andrew Center does is teaches. Yeah, well, so tell us. Yep. We'll go right into it. So tell us, um, what is the what Andrew is the Center Andrew for Center? Restorative Justice? Uh, so again, Sue and Louis Andrew decided they were going to give um, a gift um, and endow the restorative justice work that Janine was doing here. And it became the Andrew Center for Restorative Justice. Um, and to me, it's this hub um, that we're continuing to build off of what Janine did and what I'm going to do um, to teach, practice, and promote restorative justice, um, both here at the law school, on the campus, um, in the community, hopefully maybe nationally and internationally like Janine had been doing. Um, one aspect of it, of course, is teaching law students not just the principles um, and the nuts and bolts of restorative justice, but how they can use it in their practice when they graduate to be better lawyers, to be people who can resolve conflict in a different way, to be peacemakers. Um, and I say that because I really truly believe restorative justice has this ability to transform lives. And I don't use transform a lot. I never used it when I was a judge. What I used was sort of this word reshaping justice, right? Because that's what we do when we look at justice in a different way. And restorative justice is a way to look at justice in a different way. And, and it, you take a look at um, crime or wrongdoing, harm and consequences, and you pull it away from the traditional model, right? That asks the question, you know, uh, who committed the crime? Um, and what should their punishment be? And we change the conversation. And the conversation becomes, who is harmed? Right? That's the first question. And when we ask that question, right, who is harmed, we center victims. We don't sideline them anymore like we've done in the traditional justice process. Um, and we give voice to people who are survivors. The second question that we ask in terms of restorative justice is what is the harm? And we, when we ask that question, what is the harm, we use storytelling and we listen to the victim and we understand that harm is not a one and done, right? Harm is something that can continue on for a lifetime with some people. So there's these ripple effects of harm and we storytell Sometimes in circles, like the indigenous um, or First Nations would do. Sometimes in victim-offender dialogues. But we story tell so that people who harm can understand the impact of their wrongdoing on an individual. And then the third question we ask, which I think is one of the most important, which you and I would never hear when we're sitting on the bench, is how can we repair the harm? How do we help people heal? How do we repair harm? Um, and when I teach, I say, who's ever been part of the traditional criminal justice? Have you ever heard that 
asked Never. in a court. Not a lot of healing. Not a lot of healing. Um, and so we work with offenders, people who have harmed, people who have committed wrongful acts, not just in the justice system, but elsewhere, you know, because restorative justice fits within not just criminal or juvenile justice, um, but in schools, in businesses. Um, and we ask the offender, and we ask the community who's part of the conversation, and we ask those who have been harmed, what do we need to do to meet the needs of everybody involved? And what do we need to do to get to healing? And I'll say, sometimes we'll never get to healed, but at least we can get a little bit more healing, right? And so that's what we're trying to do and grow here at the Andrews Center for Restorative Justice. And you told me a story, and you probably have a number of them, that best described restorative justice. And if you remember, you talked about a, a case that you had and how you implied restorative justice policies and concepts. And then you had, to, if you could explain that sure. story for me. Sure. I think it gives a good idea about what restorative justice is all about. So when I was a baby judge, <laughs> um, uh, I, was, I participated in Janine Geske's uh, circle process at Green Bay Correctional. I see people shaking their heads, so some of you have probably graduated from her three-day circle event. And then I went back to Children's Court, and the district attorney's office had been practicing some restorative justice uh, work through uh, community conferencing and different kinds of dialoguing um, with youth who had been charged with delinquent crimes. And of course, after you know, I did the three-day event with Janine, I'm like, yeah, we're going to do more of this, right? And it, um, it, I was involved in my, on my caseload with um, a youth, I think he was around 13, 14 years old. And him and his buddies decide they're going to go out into the community and they find this, um, this uh, dealership, a small dealership, not one of the big large dealerships that you see on the west side of town. And they decide in the middle of the night they're going to just destroy everything, right? That's what kids do. We, see, we still see that today. Um, that was back in 2007. And so they're popping tires, they're breaking glass, it's just a mess. And you know, lo and behold, they get caught, duh, right? Most of these kids do when they're doing this. And um, the one individual that got caught, no prior record, messing around, went around with the crowd. He was following the older boys. And so did this thing called a consent decree where he, he has to plead guilty to the charge but he won't have a record if he goes through a restorative justice process. Um, and so I was all excited about having him do that and they were doing a community conferencing. So he was there, other people from the community was there, but the individual owner of the, um, the dealership was there as well. Um, and so you have this dialogue and it's facilitated by one of the DA's uh, persons who's very uh, professional and very, um, you know, experienced in restorative justice. And you prepare them before they go into circle and then you sit and the youth has to listen to the impact of the crime on the community, as I just said before. And then the individual um, whose business was destroyed got to speak. And so he started telling this individual about that ripple effect, right? It's not just that you broke some, or broke some windows and, and punctured some tires, but I had to close my shop, and that's my livelihood. And I had one coworker there who works for me, and I had to send him home, and I couldn't pay him, right? And not only couldn't I pay him, but he's feeding his wife and two little kids, and that's the only job they have. And so he recounted this ripple effect and the impact of crime, this crime had on him. And you can see that, you know, the individual youth is fidgeting and, and struggling. And then finally it came to him and he's tearful eyed. And he said, besides a few things, he apologized to the um, dealership owner and he said, you know what? Um, I'm, I'm really sad that I did that. I'm really sorry I did that because my mom lost her job too when we were very young. And I didn't know if I was gonna be able to go to school. We didn't get to eat a lot. So he recounted all of those things that happened to him so he could empathize, right? We want to get to empathy. 
We want them to empathize with people who have been harmed. And then at the end of the conferencing, we worked at ways to figure out how to heal. And so the, the individual dealership was all cleaned up, but the guy hired this kid to come to his dealership on weekends and clean up after people. And he had to come every day. And he had to see how the dealership worked and how you know, it was making a comeback. And so the connection between the dealership uh, individual uh, and this youth was pretty profound in the moment. And so that's what we look for, right? We figure how we can repair harm um, when all is said and done. So my last question for you is, what is your goal for the Andrew Center? Um, so, you know, I've been here now for three and a half months. It's taking so long. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll get you for that group. <laughs> um, and I, I, I'm taken aback a little bit by the number of students, both in my class and that I've been talking to, that actually are familiar with restorative justice and are really excited about its potential. And I've met faculty at the law school who are really excited about restorative justice and its potential. Um, and I have actually have one faculty member teaching with me um, because of her you know, desire to learn more and do more around restorative practices. And then I was involved in some uh, camp campus partnership um, group that comes into the law school, and Janine was hosting them to talk about what Marquette University campus wants to do with restorative justice on campus um, in terms of the school setting and student affairs. And the one thing that dawned on me that I think we all need to do, that I need to do, that we need to do on, uh, at the law school, is create a network of individuals, right, of law students, lawyers who have taken the class or are interested in it, faculty, community members, who are well-versed in restorative justice so that we can expand its reach in our community to be a level of conflict resolution, right? A way to bring people together in relationship, which is what you're trying to do as well, and everyone else on campus who believes in this work and peacemaking work, right? To bring us all together to really try to heal from the fractured world we live in. How can we deal with harm in a different way, right? As I mentioned before, how can we work together to build healthy relationships? Because they matter a great deal. Um, and so one of my biggest focuses is, is not just teaching the law students that I mentioned before, but trying to collaborate and help with others lift up the restorative justice practice, both at the law school, the campus, and in the community. Perfect. At this time, I'm going to open up for any questions that anyone might have for Judge Trigiano. Yes, all in the back. Millie. Millie, give me one second while I run over there. You know, as you were speaking, and I've watched your work throughout the community from a young person to the older person that I am now. Not as um, old as me. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to know, what motivates you to keep, because every level, it seems, is still that passion and that commitment and that dedication to make that difference and to not to get discouraged. Some people burn out and they're like, I'm through with that. I'm going to go and do something else. But you have not done that. You've had the t tenacity and the, the, the wherewithal to keep going. And I know working with the restorative justice, even that whole piece, you know, working through and maneuvering through that. So what motivates you to keep going and to have that hope and to know things will prevail the way that you desire to see? Thank you. Great question. And I appreciate your comments. Um, I think hope is the biggest issue, right? I think you hit the nail on the head. Although, although I do say it's in my DNA, my parents, my mom and my dad really instilled in us and my siblings this, you know, you have a lot in life and you're given a lot, you should give back, right? It's that pay it forward thing. Um, but I'm also energized by the people that I surround myself with the relationships that I have where people know there's hope, um, know there's a way to reshape what we do, and that you will see the fruits of that. Um, and so at every point in time when I've been able to 
help others and work together to reshape the justice system to be more humanistic, right? Um, we all got lifted by that, right? I do have to say, though, during the pandemic, um, you know, when everyone was struggling, there's a, you know, you, you border on that burnout. It's sometimes really hard, but you have to eat healthy, exercise, get your sleep, you know, surround yourself by family that cares about you and friends that will help lift you. I just taught two days uh, in the restorative justice workshop with Professor McMullen on the impact of trauma and trauma-informed care, not just on the clients that we serve, right, that, that law students will be serving in this community, but ourselves. And how can we take self-care? Because you can't do the job you do on a daily basis to try to lift people if you don't take self-care um, seriously. And so we try to do that as well. Thank you for the question. Hi, judges. My name is LaShondra Vernon. I'm alumni of Marquette. Um, I'm also a product of Geske's programming. I was one of the co-chairs of the ADR Society here. Um, I also was in the programs that were done around small claims court mediation um, and did my practicum in children's court in Judge Ashley's court. Um, but I ended up not becoming a lawyer. I ended up going the policy and advocacy route because my degree was in the public service program. Um, and I don't know if you remember the many things that I've done with you over the years and other jobs, Judge Trigiano, but one of them was the Safe Baby Courts, the programs that you did around babies born addicted to substance. Um, I also am one of the co-founders of the Human Trafficking Task Force of Milwaukee. And so a lot of the work I've done has been this social justice lens based um, mediation for the community. And so my question is, as we are looking at a new era of work that many mediators have moved on and left Milwaukee and gone to states where there's funding for mediators to work, um, how can mediators be prioritized in these new programs that are coming out of the Andrew Center so that some of us who are certified and providing those mediations in a less, not in the courts, but before we're in the courts, proactively in communities and when issues show up in policy, how will that show up in this new iteration at the Andrew Center? Yeah. That, and that's a great question. It's good to see you and thank you for all the work you're doing and for mentioning the Healthy Infant Court, um, which was just a wonderful way to, to, again, reshape justice at Children's Court with our babies, our most vulnerable. Um, you know, under the big alternative dispute resolution umbrella, right, are a variety of iterations of conflict resolution, right, mediation, negotiation, and even restorative justice um, is part of the certificate program. Um, and I was just thinking about that today, right? We, we haven't been able to cultivate a ton of facilitators in restorative justice, and why is that? And I think it's a, probably very similar to what you're dealing with in the mediation world, right? It's a, it's a really important way to resolve disputes where you don't have to touch the courthouse, where justice right now is pretty slow sometimes, right? or unhealthy in some ways. And so how can we engage some of those mediators to practice that little different iteration of conflict resolution, which is this big restorative justice thing? So um, I'm looking for certainly ad advice and help from you to do that. Um, and, and as I'm looking at you, I'm seeing Troy there, who's working on the same things you are. But I think we can do it. I think we can build up a world here at least at the law school on campus in the community um, by using tools and ways to, to train and teach people to do this work where they feel competent to do it and they feel supported to do it, right? And so I think that's really important. And I would say also, I'm looking to build the alumni group of those who took Janine's course and are taking mine so that we can touch base with people and see, are you, are you practicing it? Or are you using pra restorative practices in the world in which you are working now, right? Now, maybe not restorative justice, but some of the practices that are really good 
Um, and so I think that's good. We also have law, law students in my workshop who are like, I want to do this stuff in environmental law, right? I want to do restorative practices in the business or the sports law I'm going into. And there's ways to do that, and we need to help support each other to do it. It, here I am over here, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for this um, wonderful hour. It's been so informative. I'm, I'm here from Milwaukee Public Schools and uh, we have dedicated a whole department to restorative practices. Um, it's not as launched as we would like it to be, but in several high schools, they teach a restorative practice course as an elective course. Um, but my question for you, um, former Judge Trigiano, I'm not sure what you're, as part of the Andrew Center, are you going to be doing any outreach to some of the programs that um, are in place? Are you, you know, and, and secondly, my second question is, there, you always have the naysayers, right? The people who don't believe, that they believe stronger that justice will, will, or consequences would work better. Punitive consequences work, would work better than restorative practices. So how do you address those naysayers? Yeah. And, and have Great you question. seen instances when it really doesn't work, I guess, to, to be real? I'll answer your last question first, and then I'll go to the first one. Remind me to an answer the first one, too. Um, Yes, I've seen naysayers. Um, and, and you know what, Re restorative justice is not for everyone. And it doesn't work in every case. And, and you know, the way I say it is restorative justice is a supplement to the traditional system, but there's ways we can use it more often than we do, right? Um, I've seen cases in my 20 years as a judge which I don't believe, at least at this point, would be ripe for restorative justice. And one of the things that we look for is that the person who has harmed takes responsibility, right, and becomes accountable to the community and the person harmed and helps repair the harm. You don't get that with some people, right? And you probably won't. But I think we can do more than we're doing now in our justice system and elsewhere. Um, I've had a lot of naysayers in my career as a lawyer and my 20 years as a judge. We had naysayers and said, problem solving courts, treatment courts, what are you talking about? That's soft on crime. Until we started just showing the success that we had through data and just the individuals that we come and see. Um, and so, you know, they kind of energize me. Um, and then I, I also say so. What are, what are the results of some of the traditional court processes? Let's talk about those first, and then we can talk about restorative justice. And you know, I don't want to alienate anybody. I want them to at least see that it is a method and a way of trying to heal from harm, right? So we work with them, too. Um, I am meeting with the administration um, coordinator for restorative justice at MPS in a couple weeks with my law students. So I run a clinical. I have a, couple, a good group of students who are helping me build some of these projects. And one of the first things was to do some outreach to MPS. And I also got contacted by someone from South Division who runs their restorative program. And so we're talking with them as well. Um, and one thought is maybe we can work with schools um, and potentially the safety resource officers to do more restorative practices than traditional methods of uh, discipline. So just some thoughts, but uh, come see me. All right, we'll take one last question. Uh -oh. I'll hang around if anybody wants to ask more later. Thank you so much. Um, this is the second time that I've heard you, and I'm always so impressed by your work. Um, I'm actually going to ask a question in order to raise awareness, but I can assure you it is not a hypothetical question. Um, my question is, can a government that spied on the conversations of a person with his lawyers, as testified to in court, a government that surreptitiously downloaded information from the computers and phones of this person's lawyer 
lawyers, as testified to in court, a government that suborned perjury from a convicted pedophile with the promise of immunity, but that pedophile later recanted his testimony and said it was all lies, and a government that plotted to kidnap and poison this person. Can this person get a fair trial under that government? That's really specific. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it, it, it's hard. I think it's, it's hard. It's really specific, that one situation. And it's hard to, I, I know for me, I'm, I'll, I'll speak for myself, and if it applies to you. I, I hear your side of the story, but that's all I've heard. And so I, I'm trained as a judge. And so as a judge, I have to hear both sides of the story. So it's hard for me to come to a, a legal conclusion for you with only half of the story that I've heard. Um, but all I can say is, um, as far as the court system are concerned here in Milwaukee, um, yes, you could get a fair trial from the court system here in Milwaukee. But I can't speak as to your specific case because I only know half the story. Yeah, I, and I appreciate your question. I, I would probably say the same thing Derek just did is like, uh, it, those are really specific facts and I, I know you're trying to figure out where that's going, but I couldn't tell you either, at least at this point. But thank you for asking. So if we give a round of applause to <laughs> Judge Trigiano, the so call your judge. But before, I let every, before uh, we, we leave, for the afternoon. I just wanted to talk about some upcoming programming. I have some stuff up here for you, but uh, September 18th, which is next Monday, is our uh, next Ethnic Heritage Dinner. It's uh, Hispanic Latino Heritage Month. And so we have uh, five chefs representing uh, Puerto Rican, Mexican, Cuban, Spanish, and Salvadoran chefs to prepare meals. Our motto for these events are uh, meet someone, learn something, and try everything. So uh, it's currently sold out. However, um, we have people who have been calling us, calling us and saying, hey, I can't make it. Can I get my tickets back? So we have a wait list. So uh, we are pulling people off that wait list. We also have an event, another OTI or On the Issues for September 26th. It's um, the Wisconsin Policy Forum did a report on justice in the COVID system called Under Pressure. Uh, we're going to have Rob Hankin, who's the executive director of the Wisconsin Policy Forum as well as Chief Judge Ashley, former Chief Judge Trigiano, um, uh, uh, Waukee County District Attorney John Chisholm, uh, uh, Public Defender Director uh, Tom Reed, and uh, also the Milwaukee Police Chief uh, Jeffrey Norman. So I have these up here. I'll put them out. They're QVR codes. If you have your cell phone, you can just scan and register for those events because we get nasty emails about our events are starting to sell out quickly, so I'm giving you all first dibs. I'll put them out here so you can um, uh, use your QVR card code and you can register for the events while you're here. Thank you, everybody. I have uh, some car business cards down here if anybody wants one. Thank you, Derek. Thanks.